Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, Sean, and helping me uh, join your team and uh, allowing me to uh, hang out and learn from all you great folks here. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and also to escape 104 degrees in Davis. Um, we're going to talk about energy use and overheating in today's homes and what's going to happen over their life cycles the climate changes more and more. Uh, there's been a lot of work done in Europe and other places that I presented last year. This is going to say, okay, just uh, how, what is going to really be like in terms of temperature and humidity and heat stress indoors. Who, who among us has had uh, experience or you had your family friends experience heat exhaustion? Anybody had heat exhaustion? Uh, heat stress, which is even more severe, or uh, heat stroke, where you almost die or do die. Um, uh, how about indoors? Anybody had major overheating indoors? Okay, and you're supposedly not exercising or doing much, right? Um, well, when you look at the the epidemiological and other case data from a lot of the big heat wave episodes that killed tens of thousands of people in Europe, and California had one that was over 600 in 2006, uh, you find out that a lot of the victims died indoors. And part of it is that they don't have air conditioning, or they can't get to a cooling center, or this or that. But the vulnerable population is a big part of this component. Um, they're kind of like giant canaries in the coal mine. Um, and so that includes uh, elderly people who know somebody over 65. Who's over 65? Um, who, uh, who knows somebody that has diabetes? Uh, respiratory conditions, kidney conditions, uses psychotropic uh, meds, uh, uh, mood enhancers, whatever you call them, or antidepressants. When you add all that up, it's like over 50% of the adult population in the U.S. So those are the vulnerable people that we need to worry about. Uh, also children. Um, so with that introduction, let's see, um, what we're going to talk about is a preliminary results that are just hot off the press, it's our initial foray into trying to quantify just how hot buildings will get and what the energy implications are. And for example, the last uh, heat wave earlier this month in LA was early, 12,000 people without power after three days, uh, and record power demand. And I should mention record uh, minimum nighttime temperatures too, that 120 degrees in Chino, I think, uh, this is the, in 2018, uh, 111 at UCLA, 120 in Chino, nighttime was about one to five degrees higher than average. And high, nighttime exposure is actually probably a bigger risk and it's increasing more with climate change because it disrupts your sleep and affects your immune system and all kinds of other health impacts. And the, the, the cooling demands. High humidity is a growing concern. We're seeing more of the monsoonal moisture coming in from the Midwest and that amplifies the heat stress and the, the need for cooling. The new twist is sea surface temperatures. We're seeing those increase. And it, 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 it drives the fog off so you get more heating in the coastal areas like LA. Um, and it, it helps trap the heat and reduce the nighttime uh, cooling. So we're seeing that happen more and more. And I can't see the bottom except that uh, it's just another headline, I guess. And Bakersfield, our study site, is uh, you can see in this uh, average temperature map on the right, is right in one of the hot zones above LA five degrees above average for the whole month. That's crazy. So we spend most of our time indoors. Uh, why is indoor heat exposure important? Real briefly, death and disease is a big factor. We know that. It, it also interacts sometimes with air pollution and other, other things that are going on in the summer. Um, and we also know from some field data that newer California homes, one of the most common complaints is it's too hot. We don't know exactly why. We think some of it is bad design, some of it is bad insulation, bad commissioning or no commissioning, and sometimes just occupant error or whatever. They don't know how to really keep their house cool at night by opening windows or something because it's not safe or it's too noisy or whatever. Climate change is uh, exacerbating all these things, of course. I've mentioned some of those already. Um, I don't, at, grid outages are a growing concern with wildfires overloading the system and so on. Uh, demographic shifts, we're seeing a silver tsunami. The baby boomers are aging out, or aging up or whatever. The new new 60 is 80 something. So we have a lot of 80 year olds that are really sensitive to uh, vulnerable. I've seen my, 
my parents literally wilt in front of me when uh, on a you know mild summer day, what I thought was a mild day. So um, the economic impacts are a growing concern. Is it a Okay, we're on slot next. Indoor Sorry. Indoor okay. So Why second uh, indoor heat exposure slide? Economic impacts, liabilities, growing concerns. There's been some major lawsuits about overheating uh, condos in San Francisco. Uh, we know it reduces worker and student productivity and performance. That if it's an environmental justice issue, the people that can't afford air conditioning uh, are have a deficit in comfort and, and heat and increased heat stress. Uh, and then stress on the grid is going to affect utility rates and everybody. So in this study, we basically did a case study, single family z and &E Bakersfield. Uh, healthy, resilient, affordable was our goal. Next slide. Uh, and we did kind of a quick and dirty approach, uh, uh, unlike some of the research papers where they do fancier climate modeling and so on. And we took um, what they call climate analog cities. We found a city found cities that have hot climates now that would be similar to what we expect in the future in Bakersfield. And then we examine the building, the house performance under those future climates. We also look at a historical 2006 heat wave to see how the building would perform because the current energy models use the TMY3 type files, which are typical files, and they don't represent extreme conditions very well. And just keep in mind, heat waves are the single largest cause of weather-based mortality. More than hurricanes, tornadoes, name it. The waves. They're also typically underestimated because uh, a lot of uh, the victims show up at the coroner, and the coroner goes, "Oh, that's a heart attack," or "Oh, that's kidney disease," or whatever. When you when you tease it out statistically, you find that the actual deaths are about threefold, three times that. Maybe. And so we want to look at the impacts of the heat waves, also on power outage, which is often a, a cascading type effect in these heat waves. Uh, and then even if you have a PV system, you can't run it to cool your house. Um, and, then, and then ultimately we want to say, okay, how do we mitigate that? How do we design a house to handle future climate and so on? So here's an example of, next slide, what Fresno would look like. It would look like Chandler, Arizona near Phoenix on average uh, summer temperature heat. Eight or nine degrees hotter by 2100. Uh, so what we did is, is start off looking at Caladab website, which you haven't checked out. It's really cool. It's fun to play with. Um, you can go to any uh, neighborhood in California and click on it and see what the projected cooling degree days are, what the extreme heat days are, the warm nights, and so on. So we did that to get a rough idea of what um, Bakersfield climate will look like in the future. I also looked at the minimum and maximum temperatures for these different cities and so on, and, and for Bakersfield, because uh, just to do a kind of a check. And here's an example of CalAdapt. You can see, next slide, next slide the warm nights are going to go from around two a year up to 44 a year by the end of the century. And they define warm nights as the 95th percentile. So this is what you'd get in a bad heat wave, basically. Uh, sorry about that. You don't need to know. It's just the number of days, but I, that's... In the red red uh, text there, four, you go from about four days a year to 44. And warm night episodes, I can't read it here. So the white graph on the bottom, are those decades? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. The bottom, the bottom red arrow shows you from about present up to the future. So depending on which model you get, you might get like 70 uh, warm nights a year. Extreme heat, you see a similar trend, but more so warm nights. So here's the heating cooling degree data on the left. Is um, next slide, next slide is uh, in blue are the cooling degrees and uh, you go from about 3,000 up to 35 something to 4,400 uh, by the end of the century and so that's about a one and a half fold increase by mid-century from historical records in Bakersfield to a two and a half fold increase by the end of the century and the, the heating demand drops quite a bit so all of a sudden you're going from a mixed climate to a, co a cooling dominated climate. And your, um, your average and your peak demand is skyrocketing. And if you look at the maximum um, models, uh, projections in CalAdapt, I believe it is, for cooling degree days, it's up around 5,000 5, or so. Uh, so you, you might end up on some days having a, a year, have a tripling of the cooling demand by the end of the century. So we took those cooling degree estimates and said, okay, 
what cities match those up pretty well. And it turned out Yuma is a pretty good uh, climate analog of uh, the 2050s, and Phoenix is a pretty good camp, uh, analog for the 2090s. And here's where they are on the map. On the circle is Bakersfield, top left is Fresno, where the climate CZ13 weather files come from that we use in most energy models and building standards. The bottom you see uh, Yuma in the center, Phoenix Next on the slide. right. Next slide. Next slide. Here's the 2006 heat wave. Uh, over 100 people died, but when, when you looked at the statistics, over 650 died. Which slide are you on? Over 16,000 uh, Gary cattle died, over 13,000 people were hospitalized. High sea surface temperatures, high humidity, nighttime temperatures, and daytime temperatures were high. So heat duration is a, a concern too, what people are actually exposed to, and whether they can recover from the extreme heat exposure. And we're seeing that's gonna go way up from about, about three days a year. This is new stuff on Caladap, it's pretty cool. From about three days, a year for a four-day heat wave, uh, RCP 8.5, which is kind of worst case, um, to 16 days a year. Um, that's a heat wave. If you look at the, um, uh, let's see, 27 heat wave duration goes from three to 16. Uh, so I'm going to skip to the next slide. Next slide. This is, Emily's gonna talk about the work we did using some overheating metrics to kind of quantify in the building models what the impacts of these future climates and heat waves would be. Yeah, so for the metrics that we used, uh, the, we used the discomfort index and the wet bulb globe temperature. Um, so the discomfort index takes the ratio of the dry and wet bulb temperatures. And there's uh, different targets that indicate severe, moderate, and mild uh, stress at different temperatures. And then the wet globe temperature takes the ratio of uh, the wet bulb and dry bulb again, but with more emphasis on the wet bulb temperature. And then it also incorporates radiant temperature, which is important. And then a target that has been used for that is 28C. Um, as a disclaimer, these are um, temperatures for healthy populations and um, people who are acclimated to the climate. So those lower with um, unhealthy populations. So next slide. Um, as far as the modeling that we did, we use um, the California CBAC Red software for 2019, and then more specifically the California Simulation Engine. Um, the uh, modeling software provides prototype models that basically show um, zero zero percent compliance, meaning that they meet the Title 24 standards. So basically took that model and then uh, made minor changes to uh, make our baseline, like moving the garage and revising the door orientation. Um, the scenarios we modeled uh, for the baseline was the climate zone 13 um, using the TMY3 weather file. And then we use the Bakersfield uh, heat wave historical data. And then also simulated an outage using that historical data. And then we used uh, Phoenix for the future climate and then simulated an outage for um, Phoenix as well. And the outage dates were from July 13th to 27, uh, which matches uh, the heat wave that was in Bakersfield. So next slide. Um, so this compares the weather data. So these are the max and min temperatures in July which was the hottest hottest years for, or the hottest month for all the files. This is comparing climate zone 13 and the Bakersfield fire file. So you can see indicated where the heat wave starts, um, the min and max temperatures are pretty much matching the climate zone 13 file. But during the heat wave, um, you can see the max temperatures climbing, but also the uh, minimum temperatures climb really high as well, which is important. And then looking at Phoenix, um, next slide, slide 17, um, you can see the max and min temperatures are higher than climate zone 13 and um, for more sustained throughout the month. And now going into the preliminary results, next slide, um, this shows climate zone 13. You can see it hovers just around mild for um, a SNP of July. 
And then moving to the Bakersfield heat wave data, you can see the heat wave is marked, and then you're fluctuating over mild and into the moderate um, discomfort index. And then when we simulate the power outage, um, next slide, slide 20, um, you can see that the discomfort index climbs eventually into the severe um, category. And notice it takes um, about a day to reach moderate, and then a little longer to reach severe. Um, yeah, so next slide, looking at Phoenix. The in moderate, is that would be lethal for people who are fragile. Uh, the yeah. Heat wave killed how many people? Six, yeah, six, yeah. Over 600 in California. Mm -hmm. um, this, that index hasn't been really correlated very well to health endpoints that the wet bulb global temperature has in occupational settings. And so some people are using that too, but it's harder to cut. Right. So, and then. So for Phoenix, um, the typical conditions is fluctuating into the moderate moderate zone, and then during the power outage or simulated power outage, it's reaching the severe severe and moderate um, uh, way more often. So next slide, slide 23 for the hours over the discomfort indices, you can see the trend. Uh, you know. Part of the climate more hours over these different targets. Um, the most severe hours or most severe total number of hours was in the Phoenix uh, scenario. And then another way to think about um, these uh, hours over these targets is the degree hour. And that's the next slide, slide 24, where um, you can see relatively Phoenix goes down. And that's because it's just fluctuating over those uh, different targets instead of like sustained number of hours over the, over the targets. Um, so you can see that the Bakersfield file and then in Phoenix for the power outage, it shows the longer term heat exposure in that. And then uh, next slide. So another, so warmer climates, there's potential for HVAC undersizing. Um, in climate zone 13, we took that baseline model with the uh, baseline HVAC system and then put it in the Bakersfield and then Phoenix climate. And you can see that the um, number of cooling hours increases. And that's where the zone temperature is greater than the thermostat uh, set point temperature. Next slide. And then this is comparing the uh, energy use for each scenario where uh, Phoenix used the most, and then it was Climate Zone 13, and then Bakersfield. And then next slide shows the relative comparisons of each of those categories of energy use. So although Bakersfield has lower total amount of energy, the um, cooling load is increasing, and the heating, heating load is decreasing. And then in Phoenix, that's exacerbated, where 40% of the energy is being used for cooling load, and only 3% for heating. And then uh, next slide, it uh, shows the TDV energy results. So similar trend where Phoenix uses the most amount of TDV energy and then climate zone 13 and then uh, Bakersfield. And then the next shows uh, percent compliance. And if you're familiar with building, building energy modeling for California compliance, um, like I said earlier, um, our baseline was 0% compliance in comparison to the standard design, meaning it's meeting code. Um, and then uh, for Bakersfield, it shows a 10% increase, and that is mainly attribu attributed to the decrease in the uh, heating load, even though um, the actual cooling load is increasing a little bit. And then in Phoenix, um, and then in Phoenix, it uh, shows the same trend where um, a lot is being used for cooling. Five minutes. And, yeah. and just so I understand here, what you're saying is that these buildings will be effectively negative compliance in the new climate change world. Right. So they're Phoenix. Complying now, but future climate, they're out of compliance. Right. Yeah. So in Phoenix, representing the uh, surrogate for 2100 weather would be like negative 12% compliant due to the increase of heating, the heating load. And even if you're benefiting from 
the decrease in the heating load, you're still you have still so much cooling that you're getting a negative compliance. Is it just a mixed fuel turbine? No, it's all electric. Yeah. Um, and then that just shows the next slide shows the relative stuff where 85% of showing Phoenix in those dramatic cases, 85% of the TDB budget is for um, cooling. So next slide. It says okay. bonus slide, but okay. it's part of the regular yeah. <laughs> presentation. Uh, so then we took um, this baseline Title 24 box and we said, uh, you know, how can we optimize it? And uh, looked at a whole slew of different energy efficiency measures um, and uh, looked at the, uh, the TDV and the cost. Um, and we did it in batches to pick the top candidates in each type of building measure. And then we threw them all together because it takes six or eight hours to run the full optimization. And this is in the, uh, the BOP model. And we, uh, we started out with this, the, the TMY uh, files for Bakersfield. I don't know why I put CZ13, but eventually we're gonna look at that and Phoenix for future climate and so on. Um, and then um, the cool thing about BOP, did I mention you can look at CO2 and other things as well, although it's just grid CO2 for now. Um, and these are all the categories that are in BOP, and each one has a, a bunch of different options, like the different types of insulation or window and orientation of windows and so on. Next the next slide. And I uh, looked at um, seven of these categories, and photovoltaics is the final step to optimize that. So when I did this model, it didn't have photovoltaics, and I'm just looking at energy efficiency measures for now. Uh, here's an example of what the screen looks like. You have your uh, different measures or categories on the left. And you can, for water heating example, you have over 20 options, and I picked some that are likely, like an energy star or whatever, water heater plus types of heat pumps. Next slide. The energy, the output looks like this. You see starting up at the right top corner, your highest uh, cost and your highest TDV, and as you optimize, you go to lower and lower cost and TDV, and eventually the curve swings upward where it's gonna cost more and you don't gain as much TDV. Um, in this case, the I think the 50 and the 80 gallon heat pump water heaters were the best. So then I plug that later into the full optimization. On the bottom, you can see site energy plotted uh, in the reference case versus the fully optimized case. And you can see just from the hot water uh, bar on top, the purple, you get large reductions in hot water energy use. Here's an example of the full optimization. Uh, it does stepwise, and the lower bound represents the best combination of measures, and they do over 100 points. Um, and as you go down, once again, you're lowering the TDV. And at the, over on the left, there's a minimum cost at the bottom, and eventually it swings upward where the inflection point is. Uh, so you can also look at the family, a cluster of points around that area to look at other alternative optimum measures that are similar in, in, in the, the optimum settings there. Next slide. And the site energy, when I did the full optimization, was actually pretty good because a lot of these, you might only get one MMBTU reduction or less or something when you pick the optimum measure. But when you put them all together, you get a total of about nine MMBTU or 23% reduction. And this is our first rough cut at looking at this stuff. So the point is that, uh, you know, just using basic energy efficiency measures, you can cut your uh, energy use way down um, and at a reasonable cost. The cost um, was on the order of, um, I don't know where it went. There it is. Uh, slar sorry, I backed up. But anyway, it's 500 to $900 a year of annualized energy related costs. Um, this shows you a cool tool. You can select each type of measure, like in this case, slab insulation. And uh, it gives you a family of curves. And so you, the yellow curve is, I mean, green curve is uninsulated uh, and it's the most cost effective, but midway it switches and all of a sudden the R10 or the R5 insulation are more uh, cost effective and more TD, TDD reductions. Uh, next steps, um, I've got, the, we've got a ton of things on our wish list. The basic areas that can use uh, improvement are better weather files, especially if you can get probabilistic future weather files like they've done in uh, England. And uh, fixing uh, some of the glitches or working out things in the modeling like uh, the whole house fan option 
uh, figuring out how to turn off natural ventilation because in Bakersfield you have a lot of outdoor air pollution, allergens, and other things, so you can't really safely use uh, out uh, natural ventilation. And then big picture, um, we need to kind of calibrate and, and measure and verify that we're actually keeping homes uh, safe and comfortable in terms of temperature and humidity and radiant temperature and so on. Uh, so we can model this stuff, but we need to verify it. And there's cheap sensors out there to do it now. And we need to maybe set some design targets and, uh, and, and performance expectations for, for homeowners and clients and builders. Uh, we have a lot of other uh, wish list things here dealing with retrofits and vulnerable populations and so on, best practices. So in conclusion, we found a significant amount of overheating in some of these future climate heat wave scenarios, especially um, when we looked at the outage situations. Um, for the worst case was like 41% severe uh, discomfort index in Phoenix, the 2090 scenario. And that would probably start killing vulnerable people. Uh, if it's more than, you know, several hours, which from the Caladap data shows you we're going to have heat waves that last, you know, 14 days or on, on, on average by then. TDV, we saw big cooling load increases uh, and heating, uh, heating load decreases. And so, uh, in fact, one case, it was a fourfold increase in the CZ climate zone 13 cooling demand. So with that, we need to conclude. So are there any Last questions one. before we do that, Doug? Yes, so on Quine 25, potential impact under sizing. I wouldn't dispute anything here, but one of the things that we know from other state-funded research is that virtually you know, all HVAC systems are oversized. So I guess I'd just sort of say, let's be cautious, like drawing attention to this, because we don't want people to go, oh, we should put in much bigger HVAC systems. <laughs> Well, I, I, I think this is uh, definitely a thing for bigger discussion because the real world is one way, but we also want to think that uh, uh, do, we, do we push energy efficiency more so that there's less, there's more safety margin for under oversizing in the future? And do we want to do it in phases? And we want to say, well, every 30 years, we're probably going to have to put in, you know, a different system or something here. Um, and people are actually doing this phased climate change adaptation. They're, they're thinking about it, or at least you make it ready and easy to do.